Now what will it be? Death or exile? All right, we're gonna start with the- I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. Should we not follow the advice of the galactically stupid? You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Worst part of it is they're gonna blame us for the whole thing. And they can't have people knowing the truth. We're the best to Mordecai. The cover up. Don't forget, we're the exiles. So. Very well. <laughs> Death! <laughs> By exile. Welcome to another episode of the Film Exiles Podcast. I am your host, Manu, and tonight we are having a very special episode. Uh, I will start first and foremost by introducing you to my co-host for tonight, uh, Mike. How you doing? Millennial Mike, because we got too many mics on this pod. <laughs> hey, it's Gene Mikezilla. It's Velcro16, V-E-L-K-R-O-1-6 on Twitter. How y'all doing today? I'm doing great, and uh, we have uh, an introduction uh, a new member in our ranks. Um, uh, Greg, Drum how roll. are you doing tonight? Hey, how you guys doing? <laughs> uh, I am doing, I'm doing, I'm doing great. I am doing just fine. I am sailing smooth on the waves of the internet. Okay. The skies well, are clear. Sun is shining. The skies are clear. <laughs> Sun is shining. And we just lost all of our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice uh, outside. <laughs> Well, uh, Gray, since uh, it's your first episode, we're going to ask you to do what everybody else has been asked to do. I'm uh, Gray, why don't you tell us what are your top three favorite films? Okay, you know, I, I've, I've thought about this a lot, and I get the, I get asked this question more than you would think because of all the, the people that I interact with. And the, the hardest part of answering it for me is I don't really, I don't really believe in having a favorite anything. So I can't answer that question, but I can tell you what in my life I feel is the most consistently entertaining movie that I've ever seen. And for me, that movie is Ghostbusters, the original Ghostbusters. That is a movie that I can I can always go back to, and it's always just as funny as it was the time, the last time I watched it, and the time before, and the time before, and the time before. It is infinitely quotable. I would say that probably the only other movie that is as quotable as Ghostbusters might be Blazing Saddles. Mm. So for me, if, 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 if this qualifies the film as my quote unquote favorite, then so be it. But I, I can really only boil it down to the one that is, and I don't even, it's not even that I necessarily think it's the best movie ever made. For my money, it is the most consistently entertaining. You can jump into that movie almost at any point during the runtime. You never feel like you've missed a step. You laugh just as hard as you did the first time you saw it. And then you think about it when you're not watching it. And every time it comes up, you watch it again. Every time somebody starts quoting it, you join in. My partner and I uh, at work, when we're on the road, we have entire conversations in nothing but Ghostbusters quotes. <laughs> so there it is. That's 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 what I got. I think this is the first like comedy movie that's been on the top three. Like you know the the Exile three, I guess you know. All right. What else you got? Uh, the Crow, uh, nineteen ninety three, ninety four. Uh, directed by uh, Alex Proyas. I think it was his second. His second film, uh, it was the last film uh, with uh, Brandon Lee, the son of uh, the late great martial arts legend Bruce Lee. He, he was uh, tragically killed in an onset accident. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a, a matter of, of pop culture and film history. His death un, un, uh, was unfortunately uh, the catalyst for a lot of new safety procedures and things like that on film sets that are, that are due today. The Crow came out uh, at a time I was, shit, I was, what, 18, 19 years old, something like that. Um, and I was just leaving high school, and, and my life was emotionally, it was a mess. 
and I needed a hero that was just as messed up as I was feeling. You know, so none of the other guys, no Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, Wonder Woman, they weren't they weren't gonna cut it. I needed somebody who was in an incredible amount of pain that I recognized. Mm. Um, and I hadn't read the I hadn't read the comics. I couldn't get the comics. Um, they were very, very limited, they were very expensive. Um, they were very difficult to, to source in the days before eBay and the days before Amazon. Um, so all I had was the movie, and it was this movie that was it was this dark and tragic, painful film that also was incredibly romantic, and, and, and it just there was there was so much going on with it emotionally that just hit me just at the right time in my life. And the soundtrack, if if you were somebody who was into you know, alternative rock or grunge rock or whatever the hell it is you want to call it at that time period the soundtrack was absolutely amazing it was a cross-section of almost all the best bands working at the time of the few noticeable or, or notable exceptions uh so that one that one always stands out for me, and that one will, will always have a really really special place uh in my so it was like it was a cathartic release for you oh absolutely absolutely you know i i i would just sit there and and I would live through this character. I would I would I would vent all the emotions that a a a emotionally repressed suburban kid in the mid '90s had no other outlet for him because I had no I was I was angry and hurt all the time and I had no reason to be. My mm-hmm. parents my my my, my parents made good money we lived in a nice nice house you know i never wanted for anything but there was just this this ever expanding just pit of darkness in me that i did not know what to do with i didn't understand it wasn't until much later in my life that i began to understand you know about some of my some of my personal issues um and I didn't know what to do with it. There was no, I had no place I could put those feelings. So that was a place that I could put those emotions that my other uh, hero characters didn't allow for. Not even Batman. And Batman got really, really close. But this was still at a time when, when they were still like trying to figure out exactly how dark the character was. So mm-hmm. I needed, some, I needed some place to go that was, that was damn near pitch black. Now, I needed some place to go that was really that was really really dark because you don't know how good things are in the light until you've been through that. And if I had a third one, it would probably it it would have to be um, probably the original Star Wars. And I say the original Star Wars because I have a very very clear memory of it being the first movie I ever saw. It was the first mm. time I ever watched a movie, um, watched it with my parents. So. You know, uh, my dad and I have a have a, a a really strong connection to each other through through movies, uh, especially a lot of the stuff we watched when I was a kid. Um, so Star Wars was something. If it weren't for Star Wars, I wouldn't have started learning about what movies are and how they're made and what goes into what goes into the art of creating a movie. And as I've gotten older, you know, these things have become these lessons have become more important to me as I've gotten older. And it was the first time I had, a, I had, you know, um, a hero that wasn't in a comic book, you know, in, in Luke Skywalker. It was one of the first times that I remember dealing with the concept of mortality, Obi-Wan Kenobi's death. At that point in my life, I had never known anybody who had died. All my grandparents and everything were still alive. I had both my parents, all my aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters. I'd never known anybody who had died. And any other media that was available to children avoided the subject like the plague. It was just you don't talk to kids about death. And here it is right in the middle of this movie, the, 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 the midpoint of the drama in the film. And this character that you've been given that has has guided you through this and has has protected Luke and therefore protected you, you know, 
is just gone. And you have to deal with the fact, just like Luke does, you have to deal with the fact that he's just gone. And I'm like four or five years old, something like that. Never experienced that before. I've never had any pets that died. Nothing. <laughs> and, it t- and it terrified me for a long time because I couldn't understand what was happening. I did not under and because it's and it's the weirdest thing, of course, because it's a movie. You go back, you watch it again, you start the movie over, he's alive again, and then at some point during the film, he's gone again, and you're just trying to process that. So there were a lot of a lot of formative experiences that came out of that movie. Wow. Wow, <laughs> it's so, so personal. Like I'm just, I oh, feel like I know did, so much about you. Yeah, you did not know what you were getting into, man. You should have researched this better. <laughs> oh man, I'm 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 really happy with the answer you just gave us. Really cool. Am. Like, cool, cool. You know, um, I I I say it often. You know, like film matters in a way that we sometimes overlook. It's not just about you know being entertained for two hours. Mm-hmm. But film can teach us things. It can show us things. It can teach us about the world. It can teach us about ourselves. And that's why it matters. And that's why, you know, we're doing what we're trying to do here and trying to spotlight it and remind people out there. Sure, sure. Thank you so much for sharing, man. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. You know, I said earlier it was a special episode. Well, I, I think we're just going to call it the great episode because this episode is going to be all about you. Uh, just, you know, my parents... It's the gray this area. Big, this, my parents didn't even make this big a deal about me when I got married. So this is really special. <laughs> well, you're welcome. We're glad to be able to do what they couldn't. Okay. <laughs> so uh, for those of you that don't know, Gray has uh, a blog. His blog is called Not the Popular Opinion. Uh, uh, the film Exiles. Uh, many of us have been a fan of his blog for some time. We've we've read a lot of his pieces, and we've always come off impressed by them. Uh, I think it was Millennial Mike that approached him and thought that he would be a great addition to what we do, or what we're again what we're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Gray very recently wrote an entry on his blog called, um, "In my opinion, show don't tell: Batman versus Superman in Batman v Superman." Mm -hmm. Um, I really, really love this piece. What I like about it is that it basically shows all of the things that I like about what you do. The way that you write, your attention to detail, um, the way that you source the film and explain clearly for anybody that takes the time to read your point of view. And uh, I find this piece particularly fascinating. Oh, thank Um, you. Mike, what are you, what are your thoughts on um, his on this particular piece? I mean, I'm sure we're gonna break it down a little bit more um, in in the detail, but it just in general, like like you mentioned, the amount of detail that you put into the article was just profound. I I I stopped multiple times throughout the article um, just to like I got this information and I was just like so overcome with like you know I, I'm gonna sound so overdramatic when I say this, but I was so <laughs> overcome. Yeah, this is what I was used so, to it by now. <laughs> I'm, I'm very, I'm a very passionate person, you know. But I, I was overcome with emotion when like, I, I read this article. At certain points, I was like, man, I'm like, I just wish I was, I was pacing back and forth. I was looking around, you know, around me to see if there's anyone like looking at what I was beholding in front of me. Like, this is something truly special. I wish there was someone here to like, to like, you know, to ground me in reality because I felt like I could just float off into the, you know, into the never-ending skies after i read that like i it, it's so i know it sounds so over dramatic but i mean if only we could just read this article over the over skype to you guys right now because <laughs> there's no way for you to know how amazing it was unless you read it well uh, wait, why don't you start by telling us your blog uh, about your blog how you got started and and uh, tell us about this piece and why you decided to write it okay um i got started writing the blog about a about a year ago and this would have been um, the year after uh, Batman v Superman came out. I think it was in July. It was August or July. And, you know, like everybody else who, who had seen that movie and, and saw something in it that, that had merit, we didn't just walk out of the theater and go, oh, well, that was a piece of crap and forget about it. You know, I was engaging in a lot of conversations with people about the movie and there was a lot of, I ran into a lot of people who would throw out 
questions and criticisms of the film, not because they were trying to resolve some kind of issue, not because they wanted to gain some sort of insight, not because they wanted to delve deeper into the film in order to try and find some understanding of it. They would ask these questions almost rhetorically just to see if they could tear it down. And I started realizing that I was answering questions with information that was unsubstantiated um i was speculating i was guessing it was something that i wasn't comfortable with and i started realizing as looking through these conversations that the majority of the people that were that were having these conversations be they on or if, if they were on um one of the uh, websites i was talking to using the the discuss uh app or if it was on youtube in the comments sections what i started noticing is that we were all using language that none of us understood we were all discussing concepts that we were barely scratching the surface of uh, in terms of really knowing what the applications of those ideas were things like show don't tell things like visual storytelling uh the concept of of editing and, and color design and, and things mm. like that. So I started writing this blog with two things in mind. First of all, it was kind of a it was it was a little bit of kind of an impetuous fuck you to people. It was it was a, it was it was a way of it was a way of saying, look, I'm gonna be I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna write about this stuff uh, and and I'm going to, to take a stance on things that is clearly outside of the mainstream. Because at the time, and, and the, the tide has kind of been shifting and, it, and it's going to continue to shift over the next so many years. But at the time, popular consensus was staunchly in the category that this movie was garbage. Nothing in it made any sense. The writing was completely disjointed and, and slapdash and they were literally just throwing shit up against the wall. And nothing had any thematic connection. There was no resonance. There was no intelligence behind it. And and the director was only concerned with how good things look. And he even managed to fuck that up most of the time. And I just would sit there and I would read these comments and I would think about the movie and I couldn't I couldn't resolve it. I couldn't make those comments make sense. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna sit down because I am you know talk 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 talk. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write. I'm going to write this stuff out. I'm going to put thoughts on paper, or as it as it were, nobody uses paper anymore. <laughs> and the first art, the first article that I wrote for the blog, if you if you were to dig down into the blog chronologically, I went straight to, I went straight to the meat. I I went for the hardest question to answer about the movie i went straight to the martha moment so <laughs> what i what i did is everybody the, the big question was always and this was kind of a proof of concept for me as a writer not just as a writer but also as a as a researcher uh which is part of part of my modus operandi uh for this and and also you know for me personally i as i say a lot that my this blog is is more for me than it is for anybody else because it gives me a place to put to organize these thoughts and these ideas that I have so I have kind of a, a way of reflecting them back to myself so I sat down and I and I looked at the question of would a character in that position what would cause a character in that position to use you know a proper name for a parent or, or somebody that they're in a relationship, any sort of you know, close relationship with, instead of saying mom or mother or use some sort of nickname or something like that. So there are a number, number of concepts that I researched and um, it undertook a process of really sitting down, probably for the first time in my life, really sitting down and watching a movie with an, with an eye towards the detail, with with an eye towards... Uh, dialogue with an eye towards camera movement, where the close-ups are in the scenes. You know, what are the two shots? Where are the reaction shots? What are the lines that characters are reacting to? And once I kind of got my head around that, it was this, and I, and I sat down and I, and I, and I read the article 
for the first time, you know, and I looked through everything that I had, had written. It was this weird epiphany moment, like, I can, I can do this. You know, this is, this is something that is well within my capabilities um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an orator, uh, if you will, um, since I've you know been been speaking this stuff to people for years, I could, I could do this, and it gave me an excuse to learn new things, which is anybody will tell you is one of the most difficult things that you can do in your life is to have an, have a reason to seek out new knowledge and seek out new information. So that's what this blog has been about for me. It has been an excuse for me to go see as many movies as my wife will let me get away with. <laughs> <laughs> it has been. But it's also been a way for me to connect concepts together, to learn new ideas, or, or, or not necessarily new ideas, but, but to have an opportunity or a reason to look at things. You know, I, I wrote an article about the difference between sympathy and empathy, which is something that I never would have Mm-hmm. I never would have thought of if 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 some douchebag on Twitter hadn't brought it up, you know. So so my my hat goes my, my hat goes off to all the douchebags on Twitter. You you keep me in business, you know. So they make it, us all better, honestly. Like they, they do, yeah, they, do. The uh, all, they do. All of I, like uh, all of the arguments that we've been having, not just about Batman v Superman, but but you know, just in this, um, I don't I don't even know what to call. What what film discussion is at this point? Because it's it's definitely not discussion anymore. But, oh no, no. Well, like when you when like all of these f- arguments and debates and constant back and forth that we have, I think that they forced me to pay better attention and to yeah. you need to be better. You need to be yeah. better in order to be able to, to explain your your perspective, your point of view, and your points. Even if you know you're not entirely sure that the other person will listen, mm-hmm. but you know at least for me, I, I have really made a, an effort to to be better when I'm having these conversations on film. That is yeah. exactly that's exactly one of the one of my main perspectives um, with with these writings is uh, you'll you'll see me a lot the pieces that I post you'll see me a lot uh, refer to my toolkit. Uh, the toolkit is basically metaphor for all the different observational techniques that you bring to the film experience, um, and all the different uh, analytical techniques, all the all the little skills that you bring. That's that that's your toolkit, and I'm constantly working on working on my toolkit and and trying to refine my refine my method and things like that. But also on, on the other side is having an opportunity to share knowledge with people. I could sit down and just write about the specific subject of of a movie. You know, I could say this is what I believed happened in this film and just kind of go, here's a point, here's a point, here's a point, here's a point and just be done. Um, but all that does is give people one person's perspective on a single film. And I don't see that as being useful. So instead, what I try very, very hard to do is to sit down and talk about, here are the tools that I'm putting in my toolkit. These are the critical assessment tools. These are the observational tools that that I use. And this is this technique. Yeah, this is this is this technique. This is this technique. This is this thing that that a director will do. This is this thing that an editor will do. So it's it's an opportunity for me to not only dunk on people's stupidity about Batman v Superman, but also <laughs> but also kind of share with people, you know, some of what I've learned about the filmmaking experience, the film watching experience, and and try to show people look. You can go to the movies and you can sit down and you can have a fantastic time and you can and you can laugh and you can stuff your face with popcorn, and there's still this whole other side of things that you can engage in that doesn't make you a dork. It doesn't make you an elitist. It doesn't make you, you know, one of those people who just hates on everything. It's just an additional way of yeah. looking at things. 
And that's that's one thing I want to point out about, you know, your article today and just your, you know, your blog in general is that, you know, I love how you have so much fun when you're writing and that reflects in the kind of fun that you have when you're watching films. I think that when we're talking about about movies and film, um, oftentimes when we're analyzing it the way that we do and, you know, the way that we talk, sometimes people think that we're snobs or they think that, you know, we're elitists or that, yeah. you know, we're, we're smarter than them or something like hey, that, so you know? Some of you, some of you are snobs. Let's just be honest. <laughs> some of you, I got to tone it down a little bit. I always joke. I always joke about, you know, myself as a snob. Sometimes when I, I don't like something, I, oh, I'm just a snob. I, I say that sometimes. But See, Mike, I wasn't even talking about you, but hey, if you feel that way, like, <laughs> you, what you can stand I say? But, um, but no, but, you know, I feel that, you know, um, that you really have a, a joviality to your writing that that really expresses your feelings about film. And when I read it, it makes me want to watch movies in a, in a different way. And, I, and not in a way that will distract from enjoying it. I think there's this idea in film where, you know, if you really want to enjoy something, you have to turn your brain off. Like, that's the only way to truly enjoy it is your, your animal brain has to come out and you have to be kind of just floating to the experience in order to really experience it, you know? Uh, you can't really have true fun, you know, understanding a film on a deeper level. So, so, and, and that's the reason why I love, you know, not the popular opinion so much, because if anyone who reads this blog, they're not, like, going to hear all this endless rambling of these long, you know, multisyllabic, you know, monotone words, you know, they're, you're going to, you're going to get a lot of, uh, there's just really just great humor about it. There's just really just uh, this exploration of, of self and of film and of storytelling that it just it's so fun to read. And it also is enlightening at the same time. And it shows that those two can really cohabit. So I, I really want to express that. I mean, for, for like anybody that just hearing you talk about which movies you hold the most dear – I think that that's like a perfect reflection of how it is that you write and what it is that you're bringing to the discussion. Appreciate that. Yeah, so let's uh, let's start talking about your about this particular piece because hey. um, I think that uh, I think the first piece of yours that I read was the Lex Luthor piece about how ah, this plan yes. came together uh, as as the movie went along. I oh, thought that a piece I had I had an incredible amount of fun. Incredible. Yeah, and, and like I, I love reading it because I had never thought about it from that perspective. You know, like for me, it was always like Lex had this whole thing planned out from the jump, but the idea that he had, uh, he he just kept adapting to the situation, <laughs> made him so much more sinister. I feel. Well, it's about that, it's about character. I mean, yeah. all, all 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 this stuff. One of the things that that drives me absolutely up the wall. Um, when trying to discuss this movie with people is how they will constantly talk about how the the filmmakers didn't understand the characters. It be, and, and a lot of times they say it's because of the changes that they made or the alterations that they made. And my argument is always, look, you can't make those kinds of substantial changes and still make them work within the context of the piece, which is something people do not like to discuss. They always want to separate the characters from the context and just examine them in a vacuum. Yeah. All the characters work within the context piece and you can't make that kind of adaptation work if you don't understand the base materials that you have to work with. You have to know how the thing is put together before you can take it apart. So uh, tell us about this piece. Uh, how did it come together? Uh, what were you trying to... What was... What what was the catharsis for this piece? Like what what needed to be said? Well, the, the piece came about. This was just a few days ago. This is probably for for the for the the length and the density of it. This is probably one of the the fastest I've put together um, a piece like this. Um, and it came out of the whole thing that happened a few days ago uh, surrounding the rumors that uh, Henry Cavill was going to be out of the Superman role. Mm-hmm. And everybody suddenly, when we all thought he was going to be gone, all of a sudden, new narratives and new 
stories about how people felt about him and felt about the character, they all started to pop up. But some of the old criticisms began to began to rear their heads again yeah. as well. Yeah, definitely. And, and one of the most persistent ones, as I as I point out in the article, one of the most persistent ones is this idea that within the context of Man of Steel and Batman v Superman, that the Superman character is essentially just Batman with laser eyes. Because of the fact that he isn't portrayed as the kind of classic hands on the hip, you know, I'll bring you a hostess pie and go to your kid's softball game version of, you know, your super, your super stepdad that so many people seem to flock to, you know, because there is an additional layer of emotional density to the character that isn't that hasn't really been touched upon in a lot of his live action performances because of the fact that he spends any amount of time thinking about things that aren't overtly pleasant that it basically just makes him batman and that's always been an argument that's just driven me absolutely insane like like most of them and you know so what i did is i as i sat down and i and i took an extrapolation of that and took it to the extremes of there is within uh, BVS there is functionally no difference between Batman and Superman they are essentially the same person so I sat down and thought about okay how do we go about dispelling that you know because you can say it all day long but the fact remains that this movie doesn't rely on what I refer to as the comic exaggerations that most other portrayals use in order to contrast the two characters against each other. It's a much more straight, dramatic approach to the film. And most of the times, if you have, I mean, you sit down, you think about a movie like like Heat, okay? When it really comes down to it, okay, could you really tell me what the real differences are between Al Pacino and Robert De Niro's characters are. One's a cop, the other's a criminal. I mean, that's, that's a, basically a, it. Yeah, because <laughs> that's and, basically and, and, it. no, and that and the point behind that is is they're both just people. They're not cartoon characters. They're not caricatures mm-hmm. of those two things. They're just people, and that's the yeah. same approach that was taken in in BVS. Bruce Wayne and Clark Kent are just people living in a living in what is ostensibly a real world so how do you go about if you're making a movie and you need to create a contrast between these characters beyond the fact that one of them wears a red cape and one of them wears a black cape what do you do so i sat down and i began to think about the different ways that the characters are the different techniques that are used to to build the characters and this allowed me to extend my reach into the concepts of both visual storytelling and the idea of show don't tell which people talk about a lot but like most things as i said earlier it's 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 something that we all speak on as if it's a commonly understood idea and most people don't know what it really means we know what it sounds like it means but we don't know what it means also, I, I find that a lot of people use terminologies like like this only to tear films down. Like mm-hmm. they don't ever use those terminologies to to state, you know, where certain films have used them and succeeded, but rather they just use it to tear films down. So I find that you know they're more just weapons, you know, you know, to to bludgeon really than anything. Oh yeah, they're just they're just rocks that people lug around in a knapsack and just wait to throw. At, usually at at the at a film that's that's turning around facing in a different direction they'll hit them in the back and then they'll run away yeah they, they, they scurry off like raccoons when you turn on the lights it was a combination of two things it was a discussion of the film itself and the storytelling techniques used to build and differentiate the two characters and then it was an opportunity to talk about these other concepts which i'm not an expert on them because i'm i'm not a filmmaker i'm just a guy who writes a blog, you know, who watches more movies than I probably should. I should probably 
go outside more. But watching <laughs> movies is, is, is what I do. But it gave me, again, it gave me an opportunity. I kind of went, okay, well, let me see if I can look up some information about this. What does show, don't tell mean? What does visual storytelling really stand for? How are these things usually applied? So it gave me an opportunity to do that. And then I'm able to put that into this context using this movie as a reference that whether you like it or whether you hate it, you've probably seen it. So it was able, it, it gave me an opportunity to put this information into a context or, or, or into a context for which I know a, a great number of people have a, have a basis of reference for. So they can look at it and say, okay, here's this technique and here's how it was used in this particular scene. Here's this example that he's pointing out. So now I have something concrete to latch that on to. On the subject so, of visual storytelling, because I, I really, I do want to point out this one, this one uh, little snippet that you were talking about visual storytelling. And it also kind of ties into in discussion, whether it be in real life, you know, IRL or on the web, Twitter, you know, whatever you're using, um, people kind of use these terminologies without really having any basis uh, uh, of saying they, they, they use it to bludgeon a movie to say that it did something wrong when really the, 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 the real problem they had with the movie was something completely different. Yes. But I love this right here, um, and I'm going to read it because there's only like a, a few sentences. When most people think of the concept of visual storytelling, they think of the most obvious application, presenting an advancement of plot without the use of dialogue. But the idea of visual storytelling, especially when it relates to, cinematic, to a cinematic approach, is more than just wordlessly moving events along. As we commonly say here, everything that appears on screen in a movie is storytelling. From lighting to music, costume to set design, when applied with consideration, everything contributes to the storytelling in some way. So uh, that that was the part that got me out of my seat and made me feel like I wanted to fly off into the never-ending sky because I was like, <laughs> you 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 get you, <laughs> you get so many people who you, you you're trying to explain that. No, I, I appreciate visual storytelling not for just some painterly shot that you can pause and set as the, as the wallpaper on your phone. That's not what I'm talking about by visual storytelling. I'm talking about, you know, the, the, the idea, the philosophy of going into a movie uh, when, when you're making it or when you're watching it and understanding that everything that you're seeing is relaying information that tells you about what's the characters and the events of what's going on. You know, that's visual storytelling. And when you understand that, then by coincidence, sometimes you don't add as many words, as much dialogue into the movie because you found that you've relayed the information already in some other means. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned that, that I learned that from David Fincher. Yes. I learned that watching it, watching David Fincher, the idea of everything from, you know, you walk into a character's room. Yes. Uh, and, and everything and has a purpose. Everything, everything has, has a meaning. Yeah. Everything that he puts on the camera means something. Yep. Exactly. And that's important because there is a way of discrediting filmmakers very quickly. I I've seen this happen countless times. There are scenes within the movie that people will say, yeah, they're just there to look nice instead of asking themselves, why is he showing me this? Mm -hmm. Why is this important? What is he trying to tell me by showing me this? And like one of the scenes that pops up that comes to mind is Batman or Bruce Wayne looking at his suit before he just decides to drive yeah. to Metropolis. It's a, it's a short scene. I think it's about it's less than a minute. He oh, looks yeah. at his suit. He looks at Robin's suit before going and taking a shower and driving off into Metropolis. Mm -hmm. And as he drives away, we get our first look at, at, at Wayne Manor in the present. Yep. And there is so much that is being told in that, in that one minute. There's no word spoken, but there is so much that is being said. But instead of focusing on the filmmaker is trying to tell us, uh, as an audience, we, I, I feel that many are un, either unable or unwilling to take all of this in. I, I remember reading, uh, I don't know if it was necessarily reading criticisms or watching one of the one of the, the numerous uh, video presentations, the YouTube essays um, from people who were, you know, who would bring this up and say, what's going on with that? We never come back to it and see it again. Why are we taking the time to do this? And it becomes this this again, one of one of my biggest pet peeves 
that I've developed since I started since I started writing this blog uh, that that people do is is they want to take individual moments, individual images, individual pieces of dialogue, and they want to remove them from the context of the film and examine yeah. them as if they are the only thing that exists. Like they should be giving you all of the information that you need for whatever reason, all of themselves. And it, you have to, it's, it's hard to tell people, no, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that in, in film storytelling. If you're talking about that particular moment, let's talk about the moment where he's staring at the suit before you can even begin to look at what that means. You have to backtrack to the previous scene where he's talking with Alfred and Mm -hmm. he is telling him, you know, uh, you know, I got to go to, I need to, I need to put a, a leash on, on Luther and I'm going to need the suit. And Alfred starts telling him, you know, Hey, you know, it was Bruce Wayne that got all this information. And he, Bruce himself specifically says, well, Bruce Wayne can't get into, you no, know, can't break into Luther's house. He's separating himself. And this is something that this is where people start going, oh, you're thinking too deeply. You're thinking too hard about it. But no, yeah. it's all, it's the kind of stuff that all gets important. He's separating himself from, from Batman. From Batman. So he's going yeah. downstairs and he's looking at this suit like he's looking at himself. He's looking at a piece of himself that he can't have and he wants it and he wants it bad. It's funny how it's always possible to think too deeply, but it's never too, it's never possible <laughs> to think not deeply not enough. Deeply enough. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's like, you can always, you can always, like, like I mentioned before, you can always, you know, your animal brain can basically just drift, you know, aimlessly throughout a movie and oh, that's real fun. But if you think too hard about it, Oh, there's no way you could have fun you know, yeah. understanding the movie on a deeper uh, level. Because like, it's, it's even like Manu said, if you start to expand out from that scene, you start talking about the storytelling, you're going from Bruce looking at the suit and having his, his moment with the Batman suit to Bruce having his moment with the Robin suit. If you start to break it down, you can start to look at, okay, here's Batman. You know, there's the image of Batman. And he starts to move away from that and you see, oh, look, there's Robin. Well, there's there's a loss there. There's something there that's not that's in his life that's not good. Something happened. He moves into the shower, and you can see the scars on his body. You can see the toll that being Batman takes on him. And as he's driving away from Wayne Manor, you can see how the house is destroyed. There's there's a thread of storytelling that moves from this idea of how much he wants to be Batman to how much being Batman has taken from him. That so well said. Perfect. It, it's, yeah. And that's exactly it. And, and this entire sequence takes place without a word being spoken. Mm-hmm. And there's so much information that is being given to the audience, but nobody's paying attention to it. Well, yeah. it's not, they're not paying attention to it because it doesn't contribute directly to the plot. And people have developed a sense. I do it all the time when I'm when I'm. And it's a it's a terrible habit that I've gotten into. But when I'm watching shows on Netflix or watching something on Hulu, I've developed an instinct about what pieces of information are important to the plot and what pieces of information are not. You're watching a TV show. you're, You're binging a TV show. It's 13 episodes. You're trying to get through it in three days. You don't have time to watch everything. So I've developed this sense of, you know, where can I jump to? What am I? What are the keys that I'm looking for? And people people do that. You know, if nobody is saying anything, and there's no action happening, it's usually in a movie. That's usually in most modern films, especially blockbusters. That's usually when there's something going on that isn't necessarily important. It's just yeah. It's, it's just yeah. link. It's just connective tissue. It's just linking information. You can't just pop from one place to another. You have to show how a character got someplace. Mm-hmm. You know? Sure, sure. And that's and that's kind of a it's it's a terrible habit that I've gotten into that I that I'm really trying to to beat out of myself because if you if you use that philosophy here with this scene, you lose a lot of information about who this character of Bruce Wayne is that you're not going to get any other way. He doesn't sit down and have a conversation with Alfred where he talks about how shitty he feels about being Batman. You have to pull that information out of watching the movie if you don't do that the things the character does 
don't make any sense because you no longer have a context for his frame of mind. And, and, you know, on that point, too, information that we discard, you know, I feel like that is something that many large filmmakers are starting to become more and more aware of. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they are not putting any information in that 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 maybe could be discarded, you know, Uh, and instead put only information in that would appear to be directly relevant to the plot at that immediate point in time. And, but what I will say is that, you know, this more clearly illustrates my point. And if you're hearing this, I hope that you understand more, more fully, more comprehensively what I'm, what I'm trying to explain, you know, is that, you know, the movies that you're watching and and maybe enjoying, and I'm happy that you are, um, is that, is, is that there's, there's no room for, this kind of, you know, errant information that I can pick up and use to understand the greater context of the film. And so everything that's important is given to me right up front. And, and after it's gone, you know, I, I get this hit, I get this, this, you know, this hit. And after that, the spike goes down and it's over, you know? Right. And that's commonly uh, for, for people out there who, who, who may not be familiar with the term. When you're speaking with someone like Manu or, or someone like Mike or someone or someone like myself, and they use the term "spoon feeding" information, we're not yeah. talking. We're not talking down to you. We're not saying that you are a person who is so inept or so, you know, intellectually unrefined that you are incapable of picking up on information another way. We're really talking about. We're really talking down to the filmmakers. We're, t- we're telling you, these people don't trust how intelligent you actually are. They think you're stupid. Yes. So they're giving yes. us this information. They're just handing it to you because they have come to the conclusion somehow that you won't figure out anything else that's going on if they don't come right out and tell you. And you should all be pissed as hell about it. You should all be angry. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's circle back to the piece. Um, okay. Your piece is about <laughs> how people are saying that there is no difference between Batman and Superman in this movie mm-hmm. when, as a matter of fact, there are quite a few. Sure. So why don't you uh, tell us you know, what are the ways that Snyder uses to contrast Superman and Batman that aren't so overt? The, the first big thing that, that, that I think people miss it's 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 right out in the open and it really is in the, the first scenes that we see of the two characters within the within the the time frame of the movie proper now i generally don't consider the prologue section the you know the um the, the man of steel flashback part of of this assessment because we're really seeing the characters in a different in a different state this is no longer their status quo superman is not the outsider alien you know taking on his first big threat and batman unfortunately is no longer the guy who is you know driving out in the daytime being the only idiot running into a building that's falling over on top of him oh. looking good doing it <laughs> too and looking damn good Mr. <laughs> Affleck. It, get, right well, right in his jeep yeah well, well, well Superman, <laughs> we had that jeep. i actually little little aside for you um uh my previous gig uh within the company that i work for was doing uh warranty um, PC hardware support for uh, Hewlett Packard at Chrysler World Headquarters in Auburn Hills, Michigan, and I was working there while the movie was in production, and and um, the production had a had a, a deal worked out with with Chrysler, you know, to use their vehicles. That's why they were able to get the 200, they were able to get the 300, and the, and the Jeep, uh, the Jeep Renegade that they were using, and they had for a time two. Gotham PD police cars and Bruce's Jeep in the building. Wow! Oh, that's yeah. sick. Yeah, that, that's was, awesome. that was some cool shit. There was some. There was some good times there. That was. That was one of those. Like, take a picture, and people were like, it's just a Jeep. Like, take the fucking picture. Like, hey, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but anyway, that that information I generally disregard. So the first thing that you see when it comes to these characters, the differentiation is in the approach to the storytelling in their introductory scenes. You have Superman is introduced in a very big, heroic way. He comes flying in from no place. He smashes, he blows up a missile, smashes through a jet, comes flying in through the roof of a building in a big shaft of sunlight 
you know, standing there. And the With first the guitar thing, riff. Yeah. And the, <laughs> first, the first thing that happens is he gets a big, loving close-up. Mm -hmm. The camera pushes right in on his face. And we've already spent up to this point, we've already spent like five minutes with Lois Lane, okay, um, in that in that desert interview scene. So we're cool with her. And Lois is kind of, you know, Lois is kind of our person in the movie. Lois is, is more or less, she's us yeah. um, in this film, our, 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 our kind of end to the movie. And Superman comes crashing through the, through the window or through the, through the roof. He gets this great big loving close-up and you start to see this interaction, this, this unspoken interaction between um, Lois and Clark. Now, it, it, we take it, I, I point this out in the article, we take it as a given that Lois and Clark are Lois and Clark. To us, it, it's, we've been living with it our entire lives. Every single one of us who says we're a Superman fan knows Lois and Clark, they're always a couple, which is one of the reasons why the new 52 run of the comics pissed so many people off, because the first thing it did is it split those two people up, and that drove people insane. Lois and Clark are Lois and Clark. But as far as the storytelling goes, moving from Man of Steel into this film, we don't know what that means yet. We know there's something there, but they haven't illustrated what that is yet. So we're seeing this, this unspoken communication between the two of them, and she gives him a look and she releases her grip on, on her captor and, you know, kind of nods her head at him. And we get a nice, we get a nice Henry Cavill grin and he, he takes off after the guy, you know, there's a big difference between that and the fact that whatever is going on with Batman in his scene is scaring the shit out of everybody that's there. <laughs> <laughs> He's got, there's, 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 cells you know basically cages full of women who you know you assume he just you know released from captivity who when the when the cops try to help them out they slam the door back in his face and go i'm not going out there he's still up there are you insane and all you hear and all <laughs> yeah. you hear all you hear from the background are these sounds of these horrible you know these these pounding clanging sounds and these horrible screams yeah. you know the cops go running upstairs and you see this guy just in the corner. He's he's chained to a radiator, and he's been. I mean, his face looks like hamburger, and he's got this big, keloid scar rapidly cooling on his chest. You know, we're, you know, two minutes into Batman's introductory scene. We know Batman's there. We haven't seen him yet, mm -hmm. and when we do finally see him, he's off in the background up in the crouched in the corner like an like an animal like a like a like a, like a rabid badger you know just kind of hanging out there and and the the cop that walks into the scene is so shocked just by his presence he hasn't done anything he hasn't said anything he's just sitting there the guy is so shocked by his presence he starts fucking shooting at it this is a huge huge difference you know we are taught instinctively Despite what the reality might be, we're taught instinctively from the time we're very young that police officers are good guys. We trust them. So when you have a police officer in a scene like that, we are meant to understand that they are the good guys. So when the good guys are scared to death of your hero and start shooting at him, that says a lot about what's going on in that world. And when you have a character like Lois Lane, who is, you know, she, she's on par with us. We know she's not super powered. She's the only, th the thing that makes her special is, is her, her, her mind. mind. But aside from that, she's just a regular person. And she's telling us, hey, this guy's okay. I trust him. I trust him with my life. I'm going to let go and just, you know, close my eyes. And I know he's going to do right by me. There's a huge, huge difference between yeah. those Lois, two takes on when Lois yeah. sees Superman, there's relief. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. this sense of everything is going to be okay. Superman is here. Yeah. And Batman, the... even if he is saving people, <laughs> You're still he, he's scared. Like like you just said, there's this woman. She's in a cage, and she would rather stay in her cage because she feels safer being mm -hmm. as far away from Batman as possible. And one of the things that people take for granted 
you know, I, I've read a lot of criticism and, and and had discussions with a lot of people who, who will say, you know, well, you know, this one of the problems with Man of Steel the BVS is that is that Superman needs a he needs a counterpoint. He needs a regular person to to play off of. That's why he needs a Jimmy Olsen. He needs a Perry White. He needs a this. He needs a that and everything. And we take for granted that Lois Lane is already that character. I wrote a big response to somebody one time who was complaining about that, you know, telling him, it's like, look, you don't have to invent another character to be the man on the ground counterpoint to Superman and, and, and Clark Kent to be that grounding factor for him because we already have Lois Lane. That is part of that character's function within, mm -hmm. within the storytelling is to be that human point, that human point of view for us that, that, that says, this guy is okay. She is our in, which is another part of the, you know, generating the, or drawing the contrast between the characters. She's our in to the inner life of that character to show us what he's like without, without his, you know, his, his fancy red boots, you know, to show us who that person is. And there's that great scene that I, I think is a wonderful scene uh that introduces clark kent when he walks into her uh walks in on her in the bathroom again this is another one of those things that as fans we take as a given that oh it's lois and clark of course they're together from a storytelling perspective this is a pretty major reveal yeah it's not a it's not a surprise because we all assume at some point Lois and Clark are going to end up together. But it is a big reveal, especially in that context. If he had walked up to her, you know, like a lot of uh, let's let's take the latest uh, the latest animated film, The Death of Superman, where they're introduced Superman and or, or Clark Kent and Lois are introduced as a couple when they you know are kind of playfully arguing out in the out in one of the hallways in the Daily Planet offices for the benefit of the other people around before Lois pulls Clark into a, into a closet and basically starts tearing his clothes off. That's a pretty substantial reveal, but it's not, it, it's, it's a, it's meant to be a shocking reveal. Whereas this is more a, a revelation. Happens of, for, yeah. 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 This yeah, is more no, a revelation sure. of, of, of intimacy. You know, he's walking in on her in the bath. I mean, you don't get much more vulnerable than that, you know, and, it's it's no big thing. It's just like, hey, hey, honey, I'm home. How was your day? That's a mm -hmm. pretty that's a pretty big reveal because it says these two aren't just at a point in their relationship where they're where they're just dating, you know, and it's just like make out sessions and ice cream cones in the cover of a Simon and Garfunkel album. You know, this is a real <laughs> this is a real relationship that these two have. This is a real deep relationship that these two have and that yeah. Oh, yeah. immediately begin to tell you a lot about what's going on with the character and it lets you see this part of him where he's able to say look you know all this other stuff going on in the world look i don't care about you know the, about any of that other stuff that was happening you could have been hurt and i gotta make that a priority but no but you also contrasted because you know the relationships are what really do a lot of talking about you know, about these characters, you know, you have the public relationships with Superman, you have Lois's relationship with Superman, you have Clark's relationship with Superman, you know, and then we have Alfred's relationship with Batman, which is one of the most, uh, the most direct, like, you know, directly human relationships he has, you know, aside from, you know, the people he interacts with as Batman, you know, um, he, he's really only Bruce around maybe him, and then, of course, you know, Diana uh, down the road, well, and then which there's both also of those... There's the people at, at Wayne Enterprises also. But the interesting thing about that is he is he is clearly the boss there, which is another mm -hmm. aspect, which is another piece of character building. He is very much in charge of that of that relationship. It is a very it is a, it is a boss employee relationship there, which is important to, to note. You know, he knows these people on a first name basis, but it's very, very clear. It's like, look, I'm I'm the I'm, I'm the HNIC here. So you're going to have to find a way to deal. Yeah, one of my favorite things about this movie in particular are those two relationships. The mm -hmm. Lois and Clark relationship is 
probably one of the most underrated things in this film because mm-hmm. so much of it is unspoken. Yep. And and it makes sense because of who Clark is in this version of the character. Yeah. Clark is basically an introvert. The Clark <laughs> that we see, he doesn't talk a lot. But Lois understands him by visual cues. Like, every time they're together, they there's these moments where they're just looking at each other and they're not saying anything, but you can tell that there's a conversation that is taking place between the two of them and mm-hmm. no word needs to be spoken. That's something that makes people really uncomfortable. I've noticed. And 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 and, and, yeah. and and I understand it because it's almost too intimate. When you're with someone for a long time and you're that close together, you're living together, you're walking into the bathroom while they're in the bath, mm-hmm. you you gain that level of understanding over time. And they have it. And throughout the film there are these moments when they are just looking at each other and talking to each other. Mm-hmm. And and it it seems almost like you're a voyeur into into their relationship. Yeah. Well at mm. least when when he he saves her when she's falling off of the building. Uh right before he flies back up to meet up with Luther, there that there, there's there's one right there. And yeah, also yeah. right after the confrontation with Batman before he flies off to the ship Again, they're there looking at each other, and and there's so much that's being said, but Very it's limited. not being said. Very limited dialogue. What people really cue in on, and this I think goes back to the conversation about when people, how we have learned when to check in and check out of a, out of a film or out of a television show about what pieces of information are important. People, and and rightfully. Rightfully so. It's easy to understand. We like the kind of, as as Aaron Sorkin calls it, the kind of musicality of dialogue. Ha ha ha! I love that line. Yeah. You know, you know, <laughs> yeah. there and there and but but it's absolutely true. There's a there's a there's the rhythm of of people talking yeah. to one another. The rhythm of speech. But also, we like the idea of characters bouncing back and forth. I mean, you look at when people talk about you know the type banter. of that they like. You know, the banter, banter. exactly. Yeah. Banter. People banter. Love, I, oh people my goodness. Love, people I've, love banter. I've it's heard so the term amusing banter based directing more in the past few years than I've ever heard. Who knew there was a form of banter based <laughs> directing? Like, that's the actual thing. Like, oh, what's your skill? Oh, I'm, my skill is banter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, where, I mean, that's, that's not bad. It's fine. I mean, that's really, I mean, that, that's, that's something that, I mean, it, let's come right out and say it. Joss Whedon is actually really good at it. You He's know, very Shane, good at it. Shane, Shane, Shane Black. Yeah is very good at it you know and these are directors who in the last few last year, maybe not so much Joss Whedon because he's had you know sort of some other things go on but James Gunn and, and Shane Black have seen their profiles raise remarkably in the last few years and it just so happens to be that these are things that they've been known for for a long time as writers but well, Taika right the, the yeah. Taika with DC you know yeah you know it's this it's people like it, it, people really like when characters bounce dialogue back and forth between between the two of them. You know, Manu was was speaking of you know all the the silent, intimate moments between Lois and and Clark. You know, the let's take in particular the the moment after he's after he's he's rescued her from uh, from Luther's little little slip up. At the top, of, uh, at the top of the, the that's, what, tower. that's what we're calling it now. A slip yeah, up. The slip <laughs> up. You know, and he puts her down on the ground. She she has a line of dialogue where she you know points out you she says you came back. It's she it's a softly it spoken line of dialogue. She says but it twice. It, there, you know. She says it twice. I love that yeah. she says it twice. You came yeah. back. You yeah, came like back. Well, like like she's even surprised because she because well, she didn't know what was going to happen. You know, was he going to be gone forever? But he doesn't say a word. Now I can imagine. A different director inserting some piece of dialogue there where he makes a statement about how he would always return for her, you know, yeah. or to, to turn, yeah. it some, turn it into some sort of cheesy, inauthentic, manufactured moment that yeah rip on it rip on that, it yeah yeah that, <laughs> that, wouldn't, that, that wouldn't be Clark that wouldn't be this version of Clark exactly yeah. this version, because Clark doesn't talk. 
it's very it's very rare that he talks and but i thought the strength in harry cavill's performance as clark was that he was always emoting so much through his facial yeah. tics yeah like there's just so much that's always going on on his face at all times like when he calls his mother in the middle of the night and he asks her why his father never left kansas Mm-hmm. And 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 his mother answers, "Where am I gonna go? I'm already yeah, here." Yeah, like what you said. Well, and, you, and he has you know, this you know, look. You know him. You, well, you no, know how he was. You, you know, know where am I gonna and, go? I'm already there. Yeah, and and there's this his the look on his face says so much. There and and also uh, before he decides to go to the Capitol and he goes to see her, and she tells him, "You you can be whatever you want," mm-hmm. and and there's this expression of of pain there mm-hmm. because. Martha is again she's not making his choices easy mm-hmm. she's letting him know that he has to make these choices but she's not telling him what to do and that's Just, more and that's how he was raised by Jonathan as well that's more of that visual storytelling yeah. as well you know that that's performance visual storytelling performance yeah, exactly. is not ju- is not just the actors emoting and then spouting the dialogue about mm. telling you know that's this is this is pure acting right here the conveyance of emotion strictly through strictly through performance nonverbal performance and people i find it are so interesting that we barely have talked about batman i mean it did just come out interesting you know and bruce I, you know, you know there's what? so much to talk <laughs> no, no no it's actually it's actually really prescient that you that you bring that up because i actually found while i was writing this article it was harder for me and it took me more effort to write the Batman sections or at least write them to a length that I felt was balanced talking about Superman because I in, mean, in, I, this, I, in these particular films, especially in BVS, I love Batman. I have been a Batman fan my entire life. He is by far a less complex character. Not, not just that. Batman v Superman is a Superman movie. Well, yeah, like, it's, it's, no, it's, yeah. It's, it's 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 not only a Superman movie; it's it's a love letter to Superman. Yeah, yeah. And, and Batman <laughs> plays an important role in the movie, mm-hmm. but it's still a Superman story. It's still it's still a story about Superman. Like yeah. every scene is about him, even That's... if he's not in it, even if he's not talking. It's the entire world is trying to figure out Superman. Yeah, I wrote, yeah. I, I wrote an article called um, "Finding, Losing, and Keeping the Faith." It's it's a it's an article that that breaks down the major components of the film storytelling wise, but also kind of talks about what I've assessed the movie is quote unquote about you know what's the what's the deal with the movie and i point out exactly that you know superman this this is a 100 percent superman movie you have your main if you have four main characters in the film okay so you've got four up until about the halfway point or where they start to re, where they start to resolve you've got four individual story threads going on you've got lois you've got clark you've got bruce you've got lex and each one of their stories Oddly enough, aside from actually three of four of them are all about Superman. The only one that's not about Superman is Superman's story. And even his story is about him basically avoiding Superman, avoiding mm-hmm. being Superman. You know, Lois's story is about trying to, uh, you know, uncover the truth about what happened in the desert. That's all about Superman because that's all about people claiming, saying he's responsible for doing something. Obviously, Batman's story is all about Superman because he wouldn't be doing what he was doing in the movie if it weren't for Superman. The same thing with Lex. You know, the entire movie is about, and then Superman's storyline himself is about him dealing with being Superman. Yeah, he's the only and, character in the movie. He, he's the only <laughs> character in the movie that, if you were to, even if you removed his portions of the movie completely, like they attempted to do with the theatrical cut. The movie is still all about him because everything that everybody is doing is all about him. Yeah, I I, um, I want to go tangential just a little bit here. I, I know <laughs> really yeah. we haven't been doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but but I do want to mention this one point because it's just burning right now. But um, <laughs> you but get you know, a cream for that. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it burned like a rat. But <laughs> but um, but no, it's 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 something that. 
you know, I get into conversations about a lot, you know, about basically, you know, I guess you could say content and then themes, you know, like something can be about something without the, that something being in the movie at all. Never. Yeah. And, and it's not, and it's not like, you know, Superman wasn't in this movie. I, I think that a lot of times, especially with these superhero movies and other genre fiction movies and whatnot, if you have two characters in the movie, right, basically the way the, the, the brass tacks of it all, when you're trying to figure out who's the main character or who's the, who's the you know, what the story's about, is who looked the coolest by the end. You yeah. know, that's, that's basically it, right? Yeah. I think that the end, you know, Superman, you know, he has a lot of doubt and, you know, he, he, you know, he ends his life on a very, you know, somber note, you know, um, basically dying for a, a world who, you know, was, was pretty cruel to him after he'd been framed by Lex Luthor and all that, you know, it doesn't really, you know, you don't, I get at first glance, if you're not really looking at it at a deeper level, you might feel that Superman didn't get like this sort of glorious send off that he the, that he deserved, you know. If you if you're putting it in those terms, you know, like right. it wasn't like trying to necessarily, you know, make him get. It wasn't trying to 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 sugarcoat it or fluff it up, you know. Whereas Batman, he got some 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 set pieces in there that made him seem really cool. Whatever, you know, he, he had the cool factor going on. Although right. at the same time, you know, he was really he was in a dark place for basically the majority of the movie, and he is not. He wasn't a, a figure to be looked up to at all. Really, not at all. No, not Snyder, at all. Snyder dragged Batman. Through yeah, the yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but like, let's that, be honest. Like he, sure, he, made, sure. he showcased the worst of Batman to highlight how much good Superman could bring to the. I've looked at the character of Batman in this movie as. Oh, let me see if I can put it another way. If you're if you're looking at what Batman's number one defining trait is a lot of people will will say that you know it's his intellect or it's his this or it's his that my biggest takeaway from batman and the one thing the most essential trait or the most essential characteristic that you have to have for any version of batman to even exist is he has to be a character that has taken this incredible trauma in his life and somehow yeah. been able to turn it into into something else you know so he's i was been, gonna say his suffering but you kind of yeah. made you add a little more more, more nuance to it like yeah. that is batman batman is his suffering it's what drives yeah. him to do anything yeah so you have a batman that you know for all intents and purposes up until this this movie you know in in the character fictional character life for this version of batman who has for 20 years been able to take that trauma or that fear that's associated with those emotions that are associated with it and channel it into something else. Then this thing happens, you know, this, this black zero event, this, this alien invasion in Metropolis, this thing happens that rattles him to his core. And what you now have in BVS is an example of what happens to that character who is, who is the same character. He hasn't changed at all but you have now this character who has lost control of that of that trait he can no mm -hmm. longer hold back those emotions that he's been able to channel into doing good and now those emotions have turned on him mm -hmm. and batman in this movie is an example of what happens when batman loses control of his ability to channel that channel that fear and channel that anger into something positive and he's looking for an outlet for it and it's i mean it's this is not just like some kind of like slipshod writing that you know chris terrio or, or Zack snyder or david goyer whoever decided well, what can we do to make batman shocking this is another example of you have to understand how the character works in order to break it yeah well, so well said. Um, uh, I think we should like just take a few minutes and just talk about other, because you've given a few examples of how Snyder uses visual st storytelling in this movie, mm -hmm. but I think that there's more 
like spread out throughout the movie i think it would oh, be absolutely. like pretty cool to like just go over a few of them uh one of my personal favorites is after perry sends him to gotham mm-hmm. to uh, follow up on the football uh he's superman he could fly there easily but mm-hmm. instead uh clark takes the ferry and, and smiles and smiles while he's on it. I love that. I and love that bit. He, oh. he walks on the ferry and then he takes a look back out onto Metropolis. And then, after right, the next shot we see him walking up to to the building of the the I forgot her name. The woman who uh, testified uh, in in court. Uh, K- uh, Kahina Ziri. Yes, we see him walking up. So. I love that because it shows that, you know, yes, he's Superman, but he's also Clark Kent. He's this humble man who, 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 when he's Clark, he lives as Clark. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also, this is his world, you know? And, you know, when, you know, when in France, right? You know, or that's how you, <laughs> right? So it's I like, suppose so. Well, I, but it, it's it, like, yeah, go ahead. It really goes back to the way the character was built in Man of Steel. Exactly. A lot of people a lot of people again, this is another thing that because so many so many of us our context for Superman within our lifetime is this post John Byrne nineteen eighty six Man of Steel uh, comic reboot world. We forget that the initial approach to the superman character basically from 1938 all the way up until 1986 was that clark kent was not a real person superman or kal-el that was the identity that's who he was he became clark kent so he could interact with people outside of being superman he would put on the persona of clark kent so he could function in the world, in in the regular world, because you can't just you know roll up to the Seven Eleven as Superman and get a Slurpee. It just doesn't work that way. <laughs> so uh, most of us, honestly, have... though, if, if that actually happened, I'm sure it would be met with thunderous applause. Yeah, wasn't the Seven Eleven destroyed in Man of Steel? Yeah. <laughs> but even in, even in, even in the seventy eight the the seventy eight Donner film, and we start out with yes, we start out with. Clark Kent growing up on the farm, we do have a version of a Clark Kent without there being a Superman. But once he takes on that Superman identity, once he leaves that farm, he stops being that version of Clark Kent. He is no longer that person. He becomes Kal-El, or he becomes Superman. And the version of Clark Kent we see from that point on is all an affectation. It is all a disguise. Because yep. that character, that teenage boy that left Smallville would not grow up to be that 28-year-old or early 30-year-old man. That is just a cartoon character that he's created. And it's obviously it's an exaggeration for, for effect within the film. But the, the point stands that we're used to that. You know, we're used to this idea. In almost in, in any other portrayal, we are used to the idea that he is Clark Kent. You know, yes, he's Cal El from Krypton, but he's lived his entire life as Clark Kent. He's Clark Kent. So we again take for granted this idea that yes, he would take the ferry to get to Gotham. Yes, he would walk to the place where he needs to get to. He wouldn't be flaunting his powers because that's not who he is. He isn't Superman. I can't remember where it comes from, and I and I apologize to anybody out there who is a you know who who is who is the Superman freak um, in their in their group of people who's going to know this. But there's a great quote that is attributed to the character where he, where he says at some point, uh, oh, I remember is from an episode of uh, episode of Superman the animated series, and it's. No, it's not. I'm still wrong about that. Anyway, the <laughs> quote, but 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 the the quote is uh, he says that Clark Kent is who I am. Superman is what I can do. I think it actually comes from uh, Lois and Clark's The New Adventures of Superman. Mm. Uh, Great Super- series, by the way. I, I really enjoyed the hell out of it's, that as growing up. And he said he says that Clark Kent is who I am. Superman is what I can do. And there is an episode of the Superman animated series um, where. Um, 
the 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 kind of conceit of the episode is the is uh, the world thinks that Clark Kent is dead. He died in like a his car goes off the cliff into the water, and people think that Clark Kent died. And somebody and his parents at one point asked him, or somebody says like, well, why don't you just you know you don't have to do the whole Clark Kent thing anymore, you know why don't you why aren't you just Superman all the time? And he goes, are you kidding? I have to be Clark Kent. I'd go crazy if I had to. Be oh Superman yeah, I remember that episode mm-hmm. actually. Now that you mentioned it, yeah, I remember it. So there's this again. There's this thing that we that we take for granted that Clark Kent is Clark Kent, but it wasn't always that way. So this whole thing about him, this goes back to Man of Steel. This building of the character as, you know, you are Clark Kent. You are our son. You are a part of us. You know, this this is who you are. You know, there's this other thing that you are as well. You know, and you are going to need to decide what to do with that. But the entire movie is spent showing us that Clark Kent is a real is a real person. That Clark Kent is the real person. And this is, I felt that the scene that you pointed out, Manu, is just is just another wonderful extension of that. And Batman fans are sad right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. You know, part of the problem is that we just had, you know, these three big Batman films from Christopher Nolan where he really he really went hard on Batman. You know, he really did he didn't really test the character. He didn't really push the character. I mean I know people like to think that, you know, the Dark Knight was like this real test of Batman as a character. No. No it wasn't. You sit down. It, That's it, it, honestly it, what any I think any villain who gives him any level of difficulty or any or any challenge? I mean, I feel like that would be pretty par for the course, honestly. I mean, Joker is definitely up there, but I mean, you know, that's what a hero has. Those are decisions that a hero, a hero has to make when yeah. he's going up against any villain that 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 challenges his his view on things. You know, <laughs> but does I mean? But at the same time, does he really? I mean, the Joker never really. He never really puts the the worst position that he puts batman in is making him choose between saving harvey and rachel harvey or rachel and then he lies to him about it too which i think kind of you know i, I think that kind of makes things kind of crap but basically you're telling us like you get to choose between saving a person or saving like another person which is which is a great dichotomy to put the character in especially when you're dealing with someone he's in a relationship with versus somebody that he basically just works with you know and, and who's mm-hmm. important to him but you're not really you're not really testing the character there because he you put the character in that situation he brought it up and the first thing that everybody who saw the movie thought was he's going to go after Rachel that's why the whole bait and switch with Harvey works because we already yeah. know the choice the character is going to make it's not a test it's not a challenge we know what's going to happen already you know yeah. so the only yeah. films don't really don't really test batman as a character you know whereas and it's not that it isn't entertaining i mean it's no, definitely it is, yeah it's it's great you know it's it's a great entertainment but it doesn't i i totally agree with you on that it's not it really it, and that's the thing is is that i think that's another reason why it, it did so well is because it doesn't challenge a character. It doesn't make him choose between, it doesn't truly make him choose between two impossible decisions and then no. let him really face the consequences of his, uh, of his actions. Maybe if Joker actually let him, you know, didn't, didn't lie to him, then he would get to, 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 to basically wallow in that, in the, the consequences of his actions. What's, but, more, what, uh, what's what's really more important? Do I save do I do I save the person who is actually doing the job of saving the city, or do I go after this person uh, who I have for, a relationship for, for, with. yeah for who who I have a relationship with, but but for all who for all intents and purposes is not as important. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, I agree. But there was a, there was you just had these big movies where they went really really deep on on Batman and. The previous Superman movies, even Superman Returns, they're shallow looks at the character. They're yeah, very yeah. shallow looks at, at Superman as a character. And I think that Zack Snyder was just really much more fascinated by what it is that makes Superman work as mm-hmm. a character. You know, Because we, again, more things that we take for granted. Superman is Superman because Superman is Superman. You know, it's just, he, he is, it's, it's, it's not even a chicken or the egg situation. The chicken is the egg. 
<laughs> you know, and I know I, I, I understand. I understand that 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 sounds like a really circular circular reasoning. But if you were to really look at not any of those previous movies and ask, well, why is Superman Superman in those movies? The question would the, the answer would be because he's Superman. There is yeah. no other reason for him to do what he's doing other than the fact that he's doing. Must it. there be a Superman? <laughs> yeah, there no, yeah. And, yeah. And there these, is, yeah. I mean, these movies are a much more complex look at who Superman is as a character, which is another thing I think pissed people off because nobody wants to do that. We just want to see Superman be our super big brother and save the day. You know, nobody wants to see Superman as a complex character because then we have to acknowledge how human the character really is. And it drives me up the wall, this idea that, that people see Superman as our savior he's not you can't on the one hand say and mike i know you and i have talked about this a number of times there's a there's a uh, uh, another person on youtube uh, kenny sama kenny sama who I've, I've spoken with him about it a lot you can't on the one hand say that superman is the most human of us and then turn yeah. around and do nothing but point out all the ways that he's not human you can't do that yeah but yeah no i mean i think i think we've really we've really gone around like <laughs> we, we've we've pretty much pointed at all the things that make Superman Superman, all the things that make Batman Batman for the most part. Um, you know, frowny Batman face. Uh, yeah, but, frowny Batman <laughs> face. Wow. But um, but no, I mean, I, I think we've done a really good job so far. Like pretty much pointing out all these these differences, and, and and most of these differences we've come to understand exclusively from this one movie you know i mean we, we talk a little bit about you know the character as a whole different portrayals and and uh and you know what makes the character really you know the character but mm-hmm. so much of that is, is is deconstructed and and really just illustrated in this movie and mm-hmm. you know I, that's why i can appreciate it so much well even things like if we get back to the ideas of of you know visual storytelling that i know manu is really hot to talk about you know if we look at the basic designs of their living spaces, you know, the, the intimacy of Clark and Lois's apartment versus the vast concrete warehouse feel of the Bat Cave. You know, the Bat Cave is portrayed as this big, dark, cold place. Office. <laughs> you know, whereas, yeah, it's basically, it's an office. It's, it's, it's where Bruce and, and Alfred work. But you even look at, look at Bruce Wayne's um, lake house. Now, the fact that, first of all, the fact that he doesn't even live in Wayne Manor, in fact, that Wayne Manor is a mess. I've I've likened um, at, at one point um, in talking about things. I likened the the condition of Wayne Manor to the condition of Bruce's soul. Yeah. In the mm-hmm. in, in the film, you know, early on when when Bruce is a child, the Manor House is the Manor House, and as he gets older and becomes more and more Batmany, up until the point where we see him in the movie. The, the house is, is falling apart, just as Bruce's soul is falling apart. When we get to the nightmare sequence, and this is a little thing that I know a lot of people missed, no matter how many Looper articles come out about it or how many times Screen Rant may have pointed it out or, or whatever it is that they do. Um, in the nightmare scene, when, when Bruce is coming up from, the, from, from his underground bunker, he's coming up out of the Batcave. Mm-hmm. And the manor is in the background. And at that point... The manor is almost is, is almost completely destroyed. Just as at this point, there basically is no Bruce Wayne. Yes, he is and just Batman see, at that point. That's why we see like that, and that's the only time in the movie where Batman kills without like without, he kills directly. That's yeah, the only yeah. time in the movie Batman ever kills mm-hmm. directly. And when and 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 I I love the fact, and I know it's hard for people to point out. Or it's hard for people to to recognize, but he's basically—I mean, he's he's more or less living in that Batman persona. And when Superman, I mean, re- like, removes sorry, sorry that, to cut you off, but before yep. you even like, but like like you said, like Wayne Manor, not only is it falling apart, it's it's not it's like even the surrounding grounds, like mm-hmm. like it, nothing mm-hmm. is being tempted to, like yeah, like there's this when he's walking towards his parents' graves. The, the 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 grass is like like thigh high. He's mm-hmm. like he has to like shuffle just to get through it. All. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's put so much. He's put so much of himself into being Batman that all of the he artifices. Yeah, all the artifices that go that go into the portrayal of Bruce Wayne are basically gone. Yeah. You know, 
But and then we get into the into the nightmare sequence. This is again more visualizing visualizing the story. Because you remember Batman's having a nightmare. This is Bruce Wayne having having a nightmare. You generally don't have nightmares about things that don't scare you. So when he's <laughs> yeah. dealing with when he's dealing with Superman, Superman has him there. When Superman re- takes the mask off of Bruce, he's terrified, and it's hard. It's 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 hard to tell that. I I guess because they didn't want to. I guess they didn't want to overplay it. I mean, you don't want to have him like you know, you know, bug eyed and and you know, recoiling and everything like that. He's still he's still Batman. He's still he's still the goat. You know, but yeah. <laughs> but 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 for but for that character, he's well, yeah. he's 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 terrified. He's obviously scared, and it's not the first time. It's not the first time that you see it, and it won't be the last time you see that look on his face in dealing with Superman. No, oh. and actually, I think that they make up for it by the way he wakes up. Like mm-hmm. he, he's yeah. clearly shaken to his yeah. core, and he, he's holding his chest like he's trying. Like he can't. Like it's. I, I feel like that scene is just. Like and there's that and then the flash appears and there's like so many things that happen all at once and and you can just tell that he's completely and totally shaken by what he saw. Yeah. yeah. Well even going into one of my favorite one of my favorite pieces uh is the uh the the nightmare in the Wayne Crypt. Cause again Yes, yes, a, yes. A, because, because because again no words, this, no words are spoken there either. Yes. And this is more visual storytelling. First of all, remember, it is still a nightmare. You don't have nightmares about things that don't terrify you. You don't have nightmares mm-hmm. about things that don't scare you. Nobody has a nightmare about the one time they went to Chuck E. Cheese and won all the tickets at Ski Ball and gorged on pizza and ice cream and didn't get sick the next day. Nobody has a nightmare about that. You have nightmares about things that scare you. So he walks into the crypt, and the first thing that you see is you see that stained glass window. And that stained glass window is obviously an illusion, drawing an illusion to the to the end of Man of Steel. So he's ple- and and it's in the Wayne family crypt where his parents are buried. He is obviously. I don't think I'm being ridiculous in saying this. I don't think I'm thinking too hard about it. He is obviously drawing a link between what happened in Metropolis, which we saw him witness, and mm-hmm. and how he feels about his parents. That yes, is a yes. very important piece of storytelling. If you don't get that, his again, if you don't get that, the things that he does in the movie make less sense because he's not operating from a logical point of view. He is I have said this in my in my um Finding Losing and Keeping the Faith article, and I'll continue to say it. Bruce Wayne in this movie is being led by the fact that he is terrified of Superman. He is scared of Superman. Whatever that means. If he's, if because, he's, yeah, I mean, like, like even how the beginning of the movie plays out, mm-hmm. how Snyder puts the death of the Waynes, and instantly from there, we go right into mm-hmm. the the Black Zero event. Yep. Is Those are the two times in his life that he has felt that powerless. Yep. Superman has brought back to so it's feeling. the feelings yeah. that he felt when he was a child. He, he, he robbed him of his power. And he's at a point in his life right now where he... The creation of Batman is all an attempt, depending on how you want to look at the character. Hey, Batman fans, we got you. We got your backs on this one. We're with you now. <laughs> um, if you want to look at the character, the creation of Batman is all about Bruce Wayne taking back control taking back that power, creating a way to deal with what happened to his parents. You know, if you want to look at it as, you know, he, he as the, you know, the kind of the classic thing where it's just about, okay, I'm not just, you know, I'm just going to go for justice and not going to let this happen again. Or if you take the very, the very direct route of like the Batman Begins route, exactly where it's like, you know, this is a thing that scares me and now I have to, now I'm going to, to use this, you know, being Batman is very, very intrinsically linked to the way he feels, you know. So being Batman was a reaction was a reaction to that. So he's been Batman for all this time. And now all of a sudden, even though he is Batman at this point in his life, now he's feeling those feelings again. And the only thing that Batman is designed to do is hit back at things. It's all he knows. That's its yeah. that's its purpose. He's like, I have a thing now that is that 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 
is an obstacle in my way, you know, and the only way I know how to deal with this is, is to, is to, to remove, remove that obstacle. it, is to, is, is to beat it up. This is, this is how I get my power back. And this is not an uncommon thing. This is not, should not be an issue that people are, are unfamiliar with. You just look at what happens with kids who bully other kids. If you follow that line back, you will usually find these kids in situations, usually at home where they are themselves being abused or they're being, they're being bullied. So they're hitting back at somebody else is their way of taking their power back. This is no different. Yeah. And I think that's a, a great, um, and, and that I believe is what Batman really is. I mean, I don't think that that takes away from his character. I don't think that his, I don't think that the creation of, of Batman in this way makes him less of an interesting character. Yes, maybe it makes him less of an admirable character, but I think that if you admire Batman, it's because you really, really have a desire to to admire him a, against maybe your better judgment. You know, yeah, I mean, maybe. You know, <laughs> um, and, and I understand that, you know, mm-hmm. I understand that, but, but that's why I loved him so much in this movie, despite some of the, the criticism levied at him. Mm-hmm. about you know his his actions and the way he a- acts you know emotionally about things um is because it all feels like it's coming from a real place and if he is truly a trauma driven character you know you can't say that everything he's going to do is going to be completely you know i guess you could say moral you know mm-hmm. because someone who does the things he's done that isn't isn't necessarily working off of a direct moral compass, you know? And when and when something inevitably pushes someone as 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 disturbed as Batman, as Bruce Wayne is over the edge, you know, things are gonna happen like they did in BBS. Yeah. To show you the kind of the, the level of total like kind of like Batman dork that I am or, the, or or dork about this movie that I am, uh my wife and I went and saw Henry Rollins speak tonight. And during the course of his uh conversation, he brought up uh he, he was showing pictures of of a child in in uh haiti who was an orphan had had lost his had lost his parents and this and this child uh he had taken a photograph of this child who was clearly traumatized i mean he was he, he, henry described described the look on the child's face as 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 cutting right through the camera lens and going straight past him and looking off someplace that he can't even fathom where this child's gaze actually was, and he and he, he talked about you know the the idea of post traumatic stress syndrome PTSD, which we all talk about with you know especially with this version of Batman, but other versions of Batman, you know this this idea of him living in this post traumatic stress, and he said that you know it's kind of the, the term post traumatic stress is is a little bit of a false descriptor for what it is because you might be living in a time after the trauma has occurred after the event has occurred, but the trauma never leaves you. You mm-hmm. live that you live that trauma every day, you know, and the rest of your life, unfortunately becomes defined by how you choose to approach that trauma. That trauma either controls you or you find a way to resolve it. And this goes back to what we were saying earlier about, about Batman. He had found a way to, resolve that trauma for a time by being batman and that was how he chose to to deal with that trauma and now an event has happened in which he has lost control of his ability to do that so now the trauma is controlling him and that's something that i think is very terrifying again for people who are fans of the character to to look at because it, it forces he's regressing. Well, well, it's not just he's regressing, but it, it forces us to acknowledge how damaged the character is. A lot of a lot of, as Batman fans, we we pride our character, we pride our hero on the fact that he's able to to move past this thing that happened and become this hero and use it for something and use it. Well, for he's a good. character who's always in control. Mm-hmm. That's that's kind of the, the thing, you know. He he, and that's the reason why he he's able to keep himself together because 
you know, he, he, he prides himself on having, you know, control. And that's what basically, um, you know, makes up for the loss of control that he's had, yep. you know, at the most, in the most formative years of his life. And it's also now, that, yeah, <laughs> it's also yeah. made that it, it, for, for years in the comics. And one of the things that people didn't have not liked about the way the character has been approached for the last, I don't know, I would say 15 years, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, is the fact that he has been kind of portrayed as this this obsessive control freak, you know, and it, it makes it difficult for him to to form relationships, which is a which is is a real kind of thing, you know. That is the kind of thing that would potentially happen to a person in in, in his situation, experiencing his level of trauma. You know, it would be very difficult for him to to form meaningful relationships and to really be able to trust people and you know and and he would be kind of a control freak and it's the kind of thing that people have wanted to that they've wanted to roll back in the comments because everybody likes the idea of the batman family and all this kind of stuff but yeah in, in this particular version of the character in this film here he's very much gone full tilt on that that portrayal of the character you know and again we're seeing what happens when that finally when, when that gets out of his control i think we should end it there Sure, <laughs> <laughs> because we're pushing up on two hours, and I think that we we did a. I think we we went over just how different these two characters are in this one film. I I hope so. That was the the whole point. Yeah, aside yeah. from aside from relaying some information about you no know, storytelling, job, that that really was the point in showing. It's like, hey, look, guys, you know, just because Superman doesn't smile like a jackass every fifteen <laughs> minutes, you know, like That's a. Like a like like a well, it's it's kind of like a I, it's kind of like a Mission Impossible too. The way that uh, Dugray Scott's character described <laughs> Ethan Hunt, you know, the hardest part about being you is grinning like an idiot every five yep. minutes. You know, <laughs> it's it's that that kind of thing. You know, just because he's doing that, just because he has a complex inner life, does not mean that he's Batman. Because nobody is as screwed up as Batman is. What's nobody. wrong with you people? <laughs> uh, you know, I like I, I say. Batman v Superman is called Batman v Superman because Zack Snyder effectively put both of these men on trial. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I can see that. And I can dig that. Everybody sees Superman as hope and Batman as vengeance. Mm-hmm. And it's in this movie as well. Yeah. No, it is. And but hope it's won. but it's got it's it's got to be it's got to be more than that. And it is. You know? But it's there yeah. as well. That's what I'm yeah. saying. It's like what we were saying at the beginning, that you can take it at face value, but it goes deeper than that as well. Absolutely. Okay. So, Mike, drop us your at and say goodbye to the people because they're tired of hearing about us. <laughs> <laughs> and from us. My God. I'm, t- yeah. I'm tired of hearing from us. Yeah. Um, All right. <laughs> All right. Well, you can, you can hit me at uh, only underscore gray at Twitter, and you can find the blog at not the popular opinion, all one word, not the popular opinion dot wordpress dot com. Uh, it's got a very lovely front page, and everything is very well categorized. And the uh, newest articles will always be the first ones, always be the first ones um, in the list, so you can always keep up with things. Uh, we have a few regular uh, uh, series that we run. Um, my humble opinion. Is basically just me saying, "Hey, this is what I think about something." Random act of uh, random acts of opinion is our semi review series where we don't really review movies, but we will talk about new movies that are out. Uh, what was that all about? Is where we talk, where we try to break down literally what a movie is about, what's the story of the film, because you'd be surprised how hard that is to really understand. Sometimes. <laughs> and not only what's the story of a film, but is there anything, any sort of metaphor, what we call the narrative conceit, um, driving it. Um, and then the last regular series that we do, uh, or the last two we do, is Don't Look Back, where we look at older films and we pick a pick a topic about an older film and, and we talk about that and it's all an act where we actually this is where we actually go through and we will break down the act structure of a film and we will talk about how each portion of that movie how those acts are used to build the total storytelling uh, for the film so it's not the popular opinion dot wordpress dot com I have no regular schedule for when I post things, so they'll just pop up when they pop up, just so you guys uh, are all aware. Uh, future articles 
just on like the, us uh, with the pod. Yeah, just like just <laughs> future future articles on the block right now. I am doing a uh, what was that all about on Tron Legacy. I am currently uh, finishing up the first draft of that. Uh, I'm going to do a, a don't look back on Aliens. Uh, don't look back on Deadpool 2. I will be doing a what was that all about on Die Hard. Um, I will also be doing a what was that all about on Blade Runner, which is a movie that is that a lot of people have have for years gone over what was Blade Runner about, what was Blade Runner about, and I'm here to tell you that I think most of them are wrong, and I am going to tell you why when the article when the article drops. Wow, so, so yeah, you, I'm I'm hyped. You're so humble, Gray. You're the one that's <laughs> going to tell all these people how they're wrong. That okay, cool. <laughs> have at it. No, have all at I, it. all I'm going to do. What was that all about? Is all it's not about. What I don't do in there is it's not an examination of metaphor. It's not an examination of themes. It is literally saying this is the base storytelling. This is how the dialogue is built. This is how the scenes are ordered. This is the face value assessment of what the storytelling is telling you. If you choose to do, to delve deeper into the metaphors and themes and things like that, and that alters what the movie is about from your perspective, I am in, have absolutely no desire to uh, transgress upon that, uh, I, I'm I'm all for everybody having a personal assessment of each film that they want and a personal interpretation. But at some point, there has to be a baseline for what a movie is communicating, and that basic baseline of communication has to be the film itself and just what's on screen. So, what was that all about? Is all about taking this is what's on screen, and when you add all those things up, this is what the movie is saying. For as far as my toolkit is concerned, so, and I so. will be, and I will be doing a my humble opinion. I just, I just decided to do this one today. I put this one into into the queue. I am going to look at the um, no man's land scene from Wonder Woman and assess both why it works and why I believe Patty Jenkins wanted to include it in the film, and at the same time talk about why the Warner Brothers executives who wanted to pull it out were right about why it should go. Mm. So stay tuned to that one. So in other words, check out not the popular opinion dot wordpress.com because it's <laughs> awesome. Ah, <Yeah>. thank you. <laughs> That's your should... mic. Drop your at. It is at Velcro sixteen. V E L K R O one six. That's Velcro spelled wrong with a K. Sheen Mizilla is the uh, is the Twitter name. Uh, that's S H I N Mike Zilla there is a profile picture of Godzilla. You can't miss them. We need to do a podcast on that movie, by the way. It's awesome. Oh, which one? Shin, Shin Godzilla? Wait until I have a chance to see it because I haven't picked it up yet. Yeah, it's, it's so good. It's so good. But anyway, that's me. <laughs> All right. And you can re- reach me at ManUnited0710 on Twitter. Uh, you can also follow the Film Exiles Twitter page at the Film Exiles. Uh, you can reach us on email uh, at thefilmexiles at gmail.com. We are on Instagram. We are on. What am I forgetting? What are we on? We and are everywhere. We are front. everywhere at this point. So, <laughs> the exit, the exiles are taking over in... the asylum. <laughs> yeah. So if we're everywhere, we can't be exiles anymore. I mean, where are they going to exile us to? That's true. Well, there are other planets. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give these people any ideas, man. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you guys for coming in. Thank you all for sticking with us and listening. And uh, we'll catch you guys next time. Have a good night. See ya.